Good evening and welcome to the 8th ICG 2020's Development Dialogue. We have with us uh, the Venerable Tenzin Priyadarshi, President and CEO of the Dalai Lama Institute for Ethics and Transformative Values at MIT. Uh, the Venerable will be in conversation with uh, Mr. Dattarat Salgaonka, Vice President of the International Center Goa. They'll be talking about happiness in the time of COVID-19. To begin with, I invite Mr. Yatin Kakotka, President of the International Center Goa, for his introductory remarks. Thank you. A warm welcome to the International Center Goa and to the eighth webinar program of the series 2020's Development Dialogue. The topic today is happiness in the time of COVID-19, and the speaker is the venerable Tenzin Priyadarshi, who is joining us from Los Angeles, America. Venerable Tenzin is the president and CEO of the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a center dedicated to inquiry, dialogue, and education on the ethical and humane dimensions of life. The center is a collaborative and nonpartisan think tank, and its programs emphasize responsibility and, and examine meaningfulness and moral purpose between individuals, organizations, and societies. Six Nobel Peace Laureates serve as the center's founding members and its programs run in several countries and are expanding. Venerable Tenzin's unusual background encompasses entering a Buddhist monastery at the age of 10 and receiving graduate education at Harvard University with degrees ranging from philosophy to physics to international relations. He's a Tribeca Disruptive Fellow and a 2018 Fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Venerable Tenzin serves on the boards of a number of academic, humanitarian, and religious organizations. He is the recipient of several recognitions and awards and received Harvard's Distinguished Alumni Honor for his visionary contribution to humanity. In conversation with Venerable Tenzin is Mr. Dattara Salgankar. Mr. Salgankar is the chairman of the Goa-based VM Salgankar Corporation Private Limited with a presence in hospitality, real estate, and private equity. Is passionate about education and the arts, and his foundation runs schools and colleges in Goa. He founded the Sunaprang Goa Center for the Arts in 2007, which has transformed the Goan cultural landscape. He's a production engineer from BJTI Bombay University and an MBA from Wharton Business School. Mr. Salgaonka is a founder member of ICG, vice president of ICG, and chairs the ICG programs committee. Before we start, ICG is pleased to announce that the speaker for the next webinar on 10th August is Mr. Rajan Anandan, former head of Google India and the present head of Sequoia Capital India. I now hand over the session to Mr. Salgaonkar, and I hope you find it interesting. Uh, thank you, Yatin. Uh, and uh, I would like to once again warmly welcome uh, Venerable uh, Tenzin Priyadarshi uh, for giving us uh, the gift of your time and your August presence uh, with us today. Let me begin, uh, Venerable, by uh, diving straight in. Let me begin by asking you about your early life, about your parents, your family, and your education as a child. How did you come to join a Buddhist monastery at the tender age of 10 years? Well, thank you. Uh, firstly, it's a uh, it's a delight to be here, and uh, and uh, very much looking forward to the conversation. I think uh, you know uh, it's uh, it's probably safe to say that my life has been filled with uh, serendipitous encounters, and and one of the things uh, that I have uh, learned over a period of time is to uh, uh, embrace uncertainty and embrace mystery uh, uh, in certain ways, and um, and uh, so I, you know my childhood was, was pretty much like a normal kid growing up in India, uh, except that uh, uh, it got uh, uh, interrupted by uh, you know certain dreams and visions and certain sightings, and and I decided to leave. Uh, 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 a very nice sheltered life uh, of loving parents and so on. And I, I ran away from my boarding school 
And after a two day journey, I ended up uh, in, in Rajgir uh, and uh, decided that uh, I was going to join the monastery. And, uh, uh, but since I was too early to make any kind of decision, I learned some early lessons in uh, negotiation, uh, especially with my parents uh, who were keen on, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of letting me just continue with my regular studies. They had uh, other aspirations for me. Uh, but we, I think we uh, met somewhere in the middle and they were kind enough to let me continue my monastic learning alongside with uh, secular studies. And, um, and, you know, that's a journey that's sort of ongoing in some ways. I think you're you're on mute Tatara. you have now reached a stage uh, venerable that uh, you know a lot of people see you as an inspiration can you tell us that what inspired you and, and who is, continues to inspire you even now um i, I think uh, it's mostly uh, certain individuals in my life that i that i met uh, who became mentor figures uh, on different things uh, um, you know, most importantly was uh, uh, the encounters with Mother Teresa uh, early on in, in uh, Calcutta uh, that uh, encouraged me to uh, think deeply about uh, compassionate action, that it wasn't just sufficient to, uh, to think of compassion as a, as a spiritual trait or a human trait, but how to sort of um, develop it in, in, in practice. Um, uh, and then of course, uh, the ongoing inspiration of, um, uh, you know, luminaries such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, of, uh, of maintaining, um, I would say a keen sense of curiosity uh, that uh, truly believing that there is uh, a lot more to be learned uh, and that we should not become uh, content or trapped in the idea of, uh, becoming experts uh, in, in, in certain things. Uh, we live in a complex world um, and the complexity of this world demands that we constantly push uh, boundaries of our learning, our knowing. Um, and that is certainly the, something that we have learned a great deal about in this past year. Thank you, Venerable. Uh, let me go to another topic before we touch upon happiness. Uh, <clears throat> this thing about consciousness. What is consciousness? Is this consciousness particular to only human beings? Or do all beings have a semblance of consciousness? And is a person who's unconscious, does he have consciousness when he's unconscious? So, uh, uh, I think it's a it's a bit of a complicated subject. I don't think there's agreement uh, on on what it is. Um, uh, uh, I, I think there's a uh, there's an analysis by Sir Roger Penrose, uh, who recently uh, I think received the Nobel Prize, but but a you know brilliant thinker. And uh, uh, some years ago, in, in in his work, he spoke about uh, consciousness and, and he sort of outlined it in a couple of categories. He said uh, there are people who believe that consciousness is, uh, you know, completely a mystery that has nothing to do with uh, any physical basis. Um, then there are those who simply believe that consciousness is uh, nothing. Uh, you know, all we have is, is, a, is a brain and as long as we have a functional active brain, we are conscious. Then there are those who believe that consciousness perhaps is something other than just the brain, but it is an epiphenomena um, uh, of the brain. And then there are those who actually don't believe in consciousness at all of, 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 of any sorts. Um, and so I would suggest that, you know, informed by Buddhist and spiritual traditions, uh, uh, I juggle between the first two categories, uh, that there is, there is some sort of uh, experience of consciousness that I believe um, at a gross level is tied to the idea of uh, uh, a brain circuitry. 
but I also believe that uh, it, it doesn't entirely um, uh, uh, has sort of a reliance on physical basis. And that sort of goes into, you know, uh, many of the spiritual or religious worldviews uh, within Buddhism and Hinduism and other traditions. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's something uh, uh, we we need to explore a bit more uh, uh, to sort of see if we can build a consensus around what it is really. Thank you. But but coming to uh, same thing, consciousness. I mean, is it because we have cognitive skills which we have developed that you know we would be more inclined towards consciousness and you know are we different that way from other uh, living beings like you know animals and plants and insects you know i mean do they have consciousness i mean so animals of course you know do demonstrate cognitive functions um, uh, quite well and and so they do have consciousness of of certain sorts um, you know, some scientists uh, even suggest that uh, the plants uh, may have some ability, uh, you know, perhaps not as uh, complex in the same way as we think about the, the intellect and the brain, uh, but that they may have also certain faculties where they respond to their external environment uh, in a certain way. Uh, so I, I think, you know, all of these uh, sentient sort of creatures to, to, to borrow from Buddhist world, sentient beings do demonstrate, um, you know, certain degrees of consciousness. I think what makes human species unique is the ability for self-awareness. Uh, and, and that is something that, you know, is, is, is not just an evolutionary skill in, in terms of that, you know, uh, we have evolved um, uh, in, in last several thousand years, um, we have, uh, you know, close to 7 billion of us, but not everybody has evolved in their sort of experience or, or, or process of self-awareness. Um, and I think that is something that is, that is unique to us that needs to be explored further. Um, and, and I think um, it will it, it'll serve as an important sort of evolutionary criteria uh, for the human species. Uh, 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 you know, the, the aspect that beyond our basic cognitive skills, can we actually become more self-aware? Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. Now, let me come to our main topic, which is happiness. Uh, you know, uh, the way we normally talk about happiness, venerable is uh, in many ways, you know, is of the material goods, uh, which makes us happy if we buy something, uh, we feel happy, social relationships, emotional and physical health, what we do for a living, and so on, which, which make us happy. However, uh, you know, many believing is not knowing or being right. So what, according to you, is the real meaning of happiness? Again, I, I think that's a, uh, that's a complex topic that we all are... Uh, uh, trying to sort of uh, uh, find certain kind of semblance uh, uh, to. I, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, that's ironical about happiness is, uh, you know, even I um, suggest this to my colleagues in the US uh, where life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is, is engraved uh, uh, deeply in the psyche. Uh, but oftentimes this pursuit of happiness simply remains a pursuit and, and, and just a fleeting pursuit. Uh, rather than its uh, its experience or recognition and so on. And so again, you know, tying it back to the previous sort of uh, response, which is that I think uh, a degree of self-awareness is is required for an individual to to understand what really would make them happy. Uh, oftentimes we live our lives, you know, uh, thinking that that there are all these prerequisites for us to accumulate or assimilate in order to be happy. And unfortunately, you know, the, the social norms uh, and so on simply dictate that idea that, you know, uh, that happiness is somehow tied to your sense of, uh, you know, uh, relationships or to your sense of accomplishments or to your sense of uh, wealth, uh, personal capital and, and, and so on. Uh, but, you know, what we see, uh, quite clearly that 
those things might contribute to uh, uh, you know a, a temporal sense of of happiness but it doesn't sort of shift our uh, perspective towards towards how we look at ourselves and how we look at the world. Uh, so, for me, again, informed by the tradition, the idea is that that you know we should sort of think of happiness in the most uh, uh, simplistic measures. And what I mean by simplistic measures is that we don't need to sort of create a complex list of prerequisites to say that if I get this and if I get that, then, then I'll be happy. Because then what we are effectively doing is procrastinating. You know, we, we tell ourselves that we should be miserable until we are 50 or 60 years old. And when we get everything that we, are, we have this on our checklist, then perhaps we'll be happy. Uh, and more often, we are dead before we experience happiness in this sort of thing of procrastination. So, so I think it's... it's uh, you know, it, it's useful again for, for individuals to, to think deeply about how to shift the mindset uh, so that uh, we can uh, experience a sense of joy, a sense of happiness on a regular basis, more often than not, um, and, and find uh, uh, other sort of tangible or non-tangible reasons uh, that, will, that, will, uh, that will bring us happiness. And, and, and this is one place that I often recommend individuals that don't always follow the social norm um, because it's not a recipe for happiness. Oftentimes it's a recipe for just misery. Uh, if we were to unpack the idea of happiness, Vendor, is the purpose of life to strive for happiness? Um, I think, I think it could be one of the functions of, of why we live. Um, you know, there are oftentimes uh, certain studies conducted where the data suggests that humans are perhaps more happy and fulfilled when they are in service of others. Um, so then the question becomes is, is that when we, when we think about purposefulness in life, uh, I think joy and happiness are, are it, but also is the sense of care, the sense of compassion that might actually fuel uh, that sense of happiness or, or the experience of happiness. Um, and so, you know, from, from that perspective, I would suggest that the, the purpose of life is to, to, to strive to become better versions of ourselves and strive to care for the communities around us. Taking that a bit further, I mean, is happiness a universal common good in that does everybody have the right to happiness? I mean, it'll be nice. <laughs> but, but you see, the, the, the challenge is that, you know, we are all sort of, uh, uh, you know, torn apart by our subjective definitions of happiness. And the moment you sort of introduce the notion, the subjective notion of happiness, everybody starts to think that they may have different reasons to be happy. happy. You see, so again, there is no consensus around, as a society, what should we strive for to, to sort of raise the happiness quotient? You know? and, and that's something that I think you will see more in conversations uh, coming up as we are moving away from you know, not moving away so much, but but expanding our view beyond, say, uh, you know, what we had considered as a metric for uh, comfort and happiness, such as GDP. And after sort of, you know, decades of simply striving to to have a stable GDP uh, as a marker for uh, uh, progress in society, now we are recognizing that actually GDP does not explain. Uh, or account for people's well-being. It does not account for people's uh, sense of empathy towards each other. It doesn't account for actually people's happiness. And, and so uh, the more the conversation now shifts towards, uh, you know, uh, understanding better in terms of metrics and measures uh, about social happiness, 
and, and so on. I think this conversation will keep coming up, which is to, to understand that are there sort of common denominators uh, that, that actually, uh, uh, you know, makes us happy and whether we can move beyond sort of just uh, certain limited subjective reasonings of, of, you know, I'll do this because it makes me happy. Uh, Venerable, you touched upon uh, certain emotions or qualities like empathy, compassion, uh, love also would be another. Uh, do these help in achieving happiness? Uh, and you also talk about compassion and action when you had uh, you got inspired by Mother Teresa. Uh, do these things help you achieve happiness and changing one's mindset and outlook? Certainly, certainly. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, it's, uh, we shouldn't simply presume happiness as a goal or an outcome of, of certain activities or certain accumulations. Uh, you know, those kinds of habits, those kinds of sort of experience, uh, you know, let me back up a bit. One is that, you know, we are not always good at differentiating between pleasure and happiness. Uh, and, and oftentimes we conflate the two and, and we don't recognize that uh, pleasurable states are very short-lived. See, our brain cannot actually handle, uh, you know, uh, a pleasurable state in perpetuity, you say. Um, uh, and, and so similarly, if you're conflating the, the, the kind of the, the, the notion of happiness that we associate with excitement uh, and so on, uh, we are physically not built to, to be happy for four hours or six hours or seven hours a day. If we are thinking, you know, in, in, in that kind of thing, it'll be exhausting, it'll be fatiguing. You know, if you just think of what you do when you're happy, you, know, you, you jump up and down, you're hugging 15 people. Try doing that for 24 hours a day. You see, it, it, you know, it, it'll get on your nerves. It, you know, you'll be exhausted. So, so that's certainly not the kind of happiness that, that, that one should be striving for. Those are good as, as sort of momentary experiences. But happiness, if we are thinking of it as a, as a serene state of mind, see, meaning a state that is not entirely tied to... Uh, the the externalities of things. You see? So it's not that if I do this, I'll become happy. It is more of how can I do this in a happier way? You see? So this idea of introducing joy into your day-to-day -day efforts, into your day-to-day -day life, rather than thinking of if I do all these things and go through all these miserable experiences, at the end of it, uh, there will be something called happiness. So I think the the, the change in mindset ought to be more around the idea of how do I live, uh, sort of create this kind of serene state of happiness uh, so that I am engaging with my day-to-day -day experience uh, in a slightly elevated manner? Thank you. Are there any sort of sources of happiness you, would, uh, you could say that, look, uh, or does it depend on uh, you know the contact, the person to person. I know it's it's very personal, but 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 what would what would a person have to do to derive happiness? Like like you mentioned, compassion action. I mean, or, right, right, right. You know, I mean, there would be momentary or whatever. I mean, let's take out the material and uh, material. Right, right. If you could just enlighten I, on what are the sources of happiness for us. I, I think you know, as as I said, that that we should go with the Occam's razor, which is the most simplistic. Uh, understanding of happiness and and you can do this as a thought experiment you know but even a simple thought you know you, you're walking down the street or when you wake up in the morning or or uh and and you see somebody who's sad and and, and you see somebody uh, who's not doing very well and just you don't even have to tell the person but just the simple thought that may i wish for this person to be healthy and happy now just that simple wish, just that generating of a simple wish of, of kindness, of others being happy, others being healthy. You, then you look at your own mind right after that, and you will see that even for a moment, you will feel the sense of relief. You'll feel the sense of relief that, that I was able to do that, and that there's this, this experience of, of, of joy that comes in. Then there are other things like you know, spending time in nature, for example. Uh, nature is 
is a tremendous sense of a tremendous source of, of joy and, and, and experiencing happiness just to observe um, all the phenomena around us and I think you know that's again something that we have learned a lot and, and a lot of individuals have reported on it um, especially in this past year of pandemic where uh, the idea was that that you know they were forced into a solitary existence and and they found that that nature is nourishing that they were able to connect with it in a in, in, in certain deeper way and and i think you know those are the places uh that that you know it doesn't cost you much to look at a river and admire the flow of things it doesn't cost you much to look at a tree um and and uh, simply be there with it so i so i think there are tremendous kind of sources of joy and then of course rejoicing in the kindness of others you see that is again also something that we need to sort of uh learn to do better uh you know well, you know one of the drawbacks of a com competitive mindset is that we are constantly competing and even in terms of doing good in the world so uh so when that when someone does good and you hear about it rather than becoming cynical about it or rather than saying that oh i can do better than that person Take a moment to rejoice, celebrate the goodness of others, uh, how they're contributing to goodness of the world, and then take inspiration from it and do something better with, with your life as well. So I think those are all sort of aspects of, of uh, uh, you know, where we can derive uh, uh, such um, uh, uh, moments of joy or happiness. Thank you so much. I think these are great uh, take homes for us. Uh, let me go to uh, another part, you know, in the Tibetan uh, uh, language, uh, the Tibetan word Sen, S-E-M, means intellect and feeling, heart and mind. Can you explain the essence of this word? It, it is so unique in its own way. Uh, can you explain to us a little bit more that how this inner discipline is the key to transforming our attitudes? How can we get right right I, I think it's 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 a similar kind of distinction we we make in uh, in Sanskrit between chitta and manas okay? um, and one of the challenges that has happened at least uh, you know post enlightenment in Europe is is this kind of uh, 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 compartmentalization or division between the intellect and rest of us. Uh, rest of our faculties and, and, and so on. Uh, to the point that we see, you know, uh, individuals sort of trying to create a scenario that uh, that somehow reason and rationality is more important, that, that intellect uh, somehow is, a, is the primary faculty um, uh, for, for humans and, and even, even in terms of other uh, biological organisms that possess complexity of intellect. Now, if you look in the Tibetan, differentiation which is derived from the sanskrit but also in the chinese sort of explanation where they use the same character for heart and mind uh, meaning that there's there's some deeper correlation between intellect and emotions that that we should uh, pay attention to um, now if you look at most sort of contemporary landscape of, of research in, in behavioral sciences you come to understand that we human beings are highly emotional creatures. See, that, that yes, we are rational, but we are also highly emotional creatures. And in fact, most of the time, most of our choices and decision making is rooted in emotional states. But we like to think that we are rational beings, but we are not. We are actually highly irrational creatures. And so one of the things that, that this, this sort of artificial dichotomy has done is that it tells us not to pay attention to a very important side of us, which is the emotions, and simply sort of try to reason our way through everything. Not really understanding that what are the criteria that actually prime the way we look at the world, prime our processes as, a, as, a, as in the mental processes and also in terms of how we respond or react to, to a given scenario. And so I think, you know, what it, it, it brings us back to is, is this idea that, that emotions and intellect are deeply connected. And in order to understand our intellect better, 
uh, will do well with understanding our emotions better. Thank you so much. Uh, and can we train ourselves uh, for this? Of course. If you couldn't train, what, what, measures do we, <laughs> what, what measures do we take? You know, if, if the thing is, yeah, if, it'll be it'll be it'll be it'll be wonderful for me to just say, oh, you know, yes, we are designed to be happy. We are designed to be, you know, emotionally balanced but it's all left to chance you know <laughs> that some people have it and some people just don't and and it's very unfortunate for them no uh i mean just like any kind of behavioral skills um uh, uh, we have an option we have a choice um and, and this is where again you know this conversation around self-awareness um, you know leads us to that that we have sort of this unique disposition um uh, you know, we live most of our life thinking or, or believing that we are simply subject to our emotions, that our emotions are simply controlled by other individuals and external scenarios, or that we have no say in it, you see. And we sort of simply cave into this idea. We cave into the idea that, oh, I'm just an angry individual, I can do nothing about it. Or I'm just a jealous individual, and that's how I was built, and I can do nothing about it. But those are sort of, again, the 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 misguided framing around human emotions uh, uh, we can train we can become more self-aware we can decide uh, you know uh, which emotional uh, uh, traits we want to experience more in our lives and we can effectively decide uh, through training how to uh, minimize or perhaps even eliminate certain toxic emotional states that we don't find uh, very useful in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, you know, that, that it is a choice in, in, in certain regard um, uh, for, for most people, if your brain fac faculties are working quite well, that you can train yourself, you can train yourself um, to be kind, you can train yourself to be compassionate, to be caring, to be empathetic. Um, and the more you're able to pay attention to those kinds of fact, those kinds of emotional, uh, traits, uh, you're able to effectively also reduce certain toxic emotional states, uh, anger, jealousy, um, uh, uh, fear, uh, one of the biggest drivers for, for many of our decisions. Uh, uh, so recognizing that, that we do have a choice and we can empower ourselves to regulate uh, our, uh, our uh, emotional landscape. Have your world can become a better place. Uh, 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 big time, big time. <laughs> you know that. This, you know this is again one of the challenges. Is is humans. You know when we think about making the world a better place, we always think about how do we change things around us. You see, we seldom look at how we are interfering with the world in certain ways, and 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 where you know, and and perhaps if we focused on some of these inner changes. Um, things will be much better for us all. Absolutely. Uh, I must mention something about COVID-19. I mean, you know, this is like a thing which has disrupted all our lives uh, in many ways. And of course, it has caused a lot of financial havoc, uh, uh, you know, whether uh, emotional havoc also, we don't know. But uh, in certain quarters, there's an air of despair and uh, sadness that has surrounded uh, many people. Uh, you know, inequality, which, which existed, has become even more deeper. And communities and people around the world have uh, suffered. And this has led to depression, uh, rage, anger. And in certain quarters, we also see violence erupting for whatever may be the reason. It just, you know, it's just a trigger point and people suddenly erupt and do all sorts of things uh, uh, which have happened. Uh, you have been working at the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values, uh, which focuses on better governance models. How do we create a more stable, wholesome and happier society, which is not only linked to GDP and and such uh, materialistic factors. 
how how how, how do we create such a inclusive uh, society you know it it is true that that the the pandemic is continuing to teach us uh, uh, many things and and not everybody's experience of the pandemic uh, uh, has been same and the the poor and the vulnerable population has suffered and continues to suffer the most and we probably will not see uh, you know uh, i mean we have no semblance of what what actually has happened uh, we probably won't get enough data to even look at the financial or capital loss or uh, uh, the loss of well-being let alone life uh, probably until 2023 or something of that nature uh, uh, as things progress um, you know it it did not only show the pandemic did not only show vulnerability in terms of our financial models but it showed vulnerability even in terms of our models of governance that whether governments at large are prepared to handle such uncertainties meaning you know we elect our leaderships and are they actually uh, equipped to to deal with such things i think the first thing regarding any effective governance um, to go back to your question is uh, would be that um, societies need to care it is something as basic as that okay. uh, if your policy is not informed from a deep sense of caring for others then chances are that you're optimizing for some other variables okay, which doesn't always account for uh, the kind of models we want to propose around you know creating a more equitable or egalitarian society or, or things of that nature like it has to come from a deep sense of care and it's rarely that we have had um, uh, you know tremendous sort of economic and other policies design that is rooted in, in this deep sense of care and and it requires sort of this you know sustained motivation of, of why we care for others the second thing is that you know any form of governance you know especially when we speak of democracies it's only as good as its ability to self correct uh, if governments lose the ability to self correct then they borderline autocracy or dictatorship because in that uh, there is no uh, there's no sort of incentive to 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 do better you know, you're just running things as they were running uh, profiting uh, uh, and concentrating power in, in, the, in the hands of a few. So again, as, as a society, we have to strive to see where such aspects of self-corrections um, 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 can, be, uh, can be emphasized and so on. But the third thing, you know, there are many factors, but the third thing I would also suggest is that we need to stop being cynical as a society. Uh, uh, cynicism, has no value in repairing or healing the world, the planet, or, or, or even our civic society. Uh, uh, that we need to replace that sense of cynicism with, with a kind of active optimism, but, but not active optimism just with the sense of hope that oh, things will get better one day. But even asking, you know, what are the roles that either I as an individual or my community can play uh, in sort of making things uh, a, a bit better and and this is again you know we do a lot we waste a lot of time and energy just being cynical about the state of the world you see uh, as it is and we seldom recognize that that cynicism has has uh, you know no quality to remedy things you know it might give you a laughter you, know, you might be entertained for a moment but it is not going to solve certain kinds of uh, scenarios and lastly you know when it comes to the notion of leadership say uh, that that you know it has become a buzzword today and, and we use it in all quarters and one of the things that pandemic showed us is this continued deficit in good leadership uh, 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 in in our civic governance of models and in, in, in our uh, uh, health healthcare governance uh, models that there is a serious deficit of leadership and how do we fill that gap which means how do we effectively uh, train uh, better leaders. And when we're thinking about in, in, in that kind of 
uh, uh, capacity, that kind of capacity building for, for good leadership, we have to recognize that systems need to change, that, that there are no bystanders or spectators to, to systems. You know, we, we have this sort of habit at times that, that we simply blame the system. You are the system. I am the system. Uh, uh, there is no system other than who we are. You see? Uh, and if we are not effectively disrupting the system, then we are simply perpetuating it. Okay. So whether you speak of corruption, whether you speak of disparity, whether you speak of any of these things that, that we think is a challenge to good governance or challenge to uh, uh, the, the wellness of the whole of society, we have to start thinking about where disruptions are needed uh, in a creative manner, not just bringing down structures, but being able to replace it with more effective, thoughtful structures. Thank you, Venerable. Uh, I have a little bit of more time, so let me go into another aspect of happiness. Uh, is happiness and spirituality linked? And You have a second part to that question? I have a second part <laughs> to the question. But I was just wondering that I should bring in religion now. You know, religion does help us get through difficult times. Uh, and, uh, you know, and provide relief uh, uh, and perhaps happiness uh, in, a, in a way. And uh, you know, going to a temple or going to a religious place does give uh, relief, uh, comfort, uh, caring, whatever. Uh, we leave it to a divine power. So uh, does uh, religion help us uh, achieve happiness? And spirituality and, and happiness. So these are, uh, these are the two dimensions which I wanted to touch upon. Uh, I wanted you to touch upon. Okay. I, th I think the, you know, beyond the, beyond the notion of established religions or religious institutions and so on, you know, what I think the function of spirituality and religious framing of mind is to look at alternate worldviews. It is to look at alternate worldviews that are not simply dictated by social norms, which are very short-lived in, in, in certain ways. Um, but what it does also is that it, it effectively keeps alluding to deeper questions, what makes us human? Um, is there you know, more meaning to life than meets the eye? Uh, meaning that you know, what, what a practice of spirituality does, or, or even in, in, in sort of religious framing, what it does is that it, it helps us to ask deeper questions. And I think that deeper question sort of allows us to maintain a sense of curiosity and maintain a sense of um, focus in terms of understanding or refining what is really important to us. You see, otherwise, you know, we can be busy with many things and life can just pass by. Say. Uh, but we are mortals. We have a finite number of years uh, on, on this planet. And, and I think, you know, these kinds of uh, spiritual framings can simply help us think through how do we use that time meaningfully or, or how, do, how do we use that time purposefully. Uh, you know, beyond that, it may give you a certain sense of understanding of life and death, two most important events uh, that, that we experience uh, 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 as humans. And it may give you certain tools to, to sort of uh, uh, go through life in a more... Uh, gracious way, uh, uh, but not sort of just, um, you know, reacting to uh, the push and pull of, of uh, the worldly desires um, uh, in certain way. So I think, in, you know, in, in that regard, it can be informative. But, you know, also we have to recognize that, uh, you know, there is a downside to, to religious institutions and uh, spiritualities institutions when we are simply seeking answers from others. Uh, when we are simply sort of 
wanting some guru or some baba to give us a template for life and tell us what will make us happy rather than sort of doing the work on uh, on ourselves and in that way you know going tying it back to this idea of consciousness from a buddhist perspective we are all unique in, in our ability uh, uh abilities uh, we all possess sort of this unique sense of consciousness and hence the you know part of the purposefulness of life is to strive for freedom or start, strive for enlightenment and and those are the things that i think a spiritual uh, bent of mind or a spiritual leaning might be uh, helpful for thank you uh, we're just coming to the close of our session uh, we ask this question to all our speakers and we would not miss this opportunity to ask you also venerable what are your five personal mantras? Oh, I stay away from those things. <laughs> you, you said I stay away from five steps and seven steps and 15 steps of things. <laughs> I, I think, you know. <laughs> uh, but you mentioned but, earlier that a sense of curiosity, sense of compassion, uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 mystery, I, I mean, you 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 pursued mystery, if I may say so. Uh, you embraced uh, uh, you know the unknown uncertainties. So maybe some of those you could just. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I I think you could derive five or seven mantras from whatever I've said. But but I I think you know uh, uh, a core thing in terms of what what informs me and drives me is this very uh, beautiful, wonderful. Uh, um, uh, I don't want to call it a concept or a notion, but but in in, in Buddhist literature and, and Sanskrit Buddhist practice is bodhicitta. Uh, you know, this this oftentimes in English translated as the the awakened mind or the awakened and altruistic mind, and and the idea from there is that that will be better versions of ourselves if we are guided by bodhicitta, if we are guided by um, uh, you know a, a more aware, a more altruistic frame. Or, uh, of our mind, uh, and that it is uh, that this bodhicitta also is essential uh, in its flourishing. Uh, it demands uh, seeking and creating healthy relationships with other sentient beings, with other humans, with uh, our external environment and the whole ecosystem. Uh, and it is it is sort of all driven with this uh, deep sense of care, compassion, and wisdom. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your time. Uh, let me see if you have any uh, questions uh, which are there. Uh, Yatin, do you have any questions for Venerable? Uh, you are on mute. There are questions from some of the audience. Uh, do you get them? No, I cannot see them. So. Uh, would you like Anita to... Dudane has a Anita Dudane has a question. Okay, uh, can you just uh, maybe can uh, I ask? Yeah, yeah, you go ahead, Yati. I can't see. So, so uh, venerable Anita Dudane asked, as physicians, we have borne the brunt of this pandemic and have experienced deep, deep burnout. How do we balance compassion with self care? Um. That's a very good question, very thoughtful question, and and I think uh, you know all it uh, it suggests that there is a primary responsibility that we have to ourselves that we can only be uh, in good service to others if we are able to take care of ourselves, and and so there is sort of a role of self compassion and self care. Uh, that that ought to take precedent uh, in times such as these, uh, because uh, you know uh, the 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 experience of fatigue uh, and burnout uh, among the community of, of not only physicians and caregivers as well. Um, uh, we won't be able to do much without them as a society. The society needs healing; it needs them, uh, but they need to sort of also uh, find the different methods and channels to uh, to rejuvenate 
Um, and, uh, and so it's very important that, that they are able to take some time off, uh, that they are able to connect uh, uh, with uh, their, themselves, uh, center themselves, and, uh, and uh, sort of engage in whatever uh, practices that allows them to experience the sense of self-care before re-engaging uh, with the world. And my recommendation only is to try to do it more frequently than not. Um, but oftentimes, if we wait till we are completely burnt out, um, then um, then it, uh, it 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 challenges our ability to rejuvenate um, uh, quicker. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a different form of resilience uh, that is required. Um, Savio Travasco has a question. Can we measure happiness? Uh, and can we maintain standards of happiness? <laughs> I think uh, that is yet to be seen. I think you can uh, probably measure certain subsets of conditions that might promote happiness. Um, but, uh, uh, but I don't think uh, we have all the tools and faculties yet to, to think about uh, a more comprehensive uh, uh, measurements of happiness. Now I've got it. Uh, so uh, this is from Shweta Trivedi. Uh, Your Holiness, uh, it is easier said than done not to wish to be cynical or encourage another cynicism. How would you recommend uh, simple steps to recognize this and nip the negative thought in the bud? I think that an active way to counter cynicism is to learn to rejoice more frequently. Uh, uh, find something, uh, you know, for every 10 negative thoughts or news that you hear about, uh, find one something that you can rejoice about. It doesn't need to be too big. Uh, you know, uh, it can be uh, even a small act of kindness. Uh, when you look at it, rejoice, celebrate it. Uh, you know, uh, have an expression of gratitude towards it. These are all sort of practices that will not only benefit you as an individual, but over a period of time, your mind will come to recognize that it no longer relishes cynicism, uh, uh, that it no longer enjoys uh, being cynical. Uh, so th the most effective thing is, is, is to rejoice. I think you're on, on mute again. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is from uh, Ashwini Panandikar. Says, as a mother of four years, uh, uh, at this current age, my child's intrinsic nature is to be happy. How do I preserve this? And how do I... <laughs> oftentimes, I tell, oftentimes I tell presents, I tell parents that be an encouraging presence and get out of the way. <laughs> So, so one way to, to preserve is don't try too actively to, to preserve it. Just let it be. And, 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 and if you don't overshadow them with your definitions of happiness and societal definition of happiness, they will find their way. Uh, you know, and as parents, and especially as, uh, as Indian or Asian parents, one important lesson we have to learn is to get out of the way. <laughs> Okay, I think now we are coming to a close, uh, Venerable. I think uh, we've had an absolutely fascinating session. Uh, we would like to thank you from the ICG for the gift of your time and your valuable advice to us. It's, it's been quite a fascinating experience for me personally and I'm sure for most of the participants. We thank you very much for the honor and the privilege for being able to host you. And thank you so much for your words of wisdom and advice. And I'm sure the world will be much happier if we even implement a few of what you have advised us. God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.